good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the ILR Alumni Association, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome everyone to this special event. I hope you and your families are well uh, and you're staying safe and sound and a little sane. Uh, my name is Jordan Berman and I'm a member of the class of 95 and I serve as president of the ILR Alumni Association. Uh, yes, that, that is me. Uh, understanding there's this phenomenon of Zoom bombing, I wanted to make sure that uh, we could verify that I am in fact a Cornell grad and not an underachieving Harvard or Princeton grad. So uh, there, there is my legitimate identification. Uh, my fellow ILRAA board members and I are really thrilled to have Sam Bacharach join us for this inspiring and timely talk in the shadow of COVID-19 leading to sustained momentum. Sam has prepared a 25 to 30 minute presentation that he'll share before we shift into a Q&A session for the back half hour. This is really gonna be a very participative uh, program. So please do submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of this Zoom screen uh, so that during the back half hour, I can serve up those questions to Sam. So definitely uh, you know, watch, but, but uh, watch from an interactive perspective. So now let me introduce our guest speaker, Samuel Bacharach, the McKelvey Grant Emeritus Professor at Cornell University. Now, many of the ILR alumni participating today first encountered Sam, much like I did, when he was a beloved professor and chair of the Organizational Behavior Department at the ILR School in Ithaca. Now, some of you may also know Sam when he served as director of ILR's New York City-based uh, Institute for Workplace Studies and as director of the Smithers Institute. Sam also conceived and founded the New York City-based Masters of Professional Studies program, uh, of which he served as director. My wife actually graduated from that program. So uh, Sam probably has more directing credits than I think Steven Spielberg at this point in his career. Now, while Sam spent the first half of his career as an academic in Ithaca, his later focus evolved towards the practical application of leadership in, a, in more of a real world context. And that focus is at the center of the Backrack Leadership Group or BLG, which is a leadership training consultancy that Sam co-founded with Yael Backrack an accomplished psychotherapist and executive coach. BLG's methodology for elevating executive and enterprise performance is based in part on Sam's work decoding the skills by which pragmatic leaders break organizational inertia uh, and move agendas to get things done. In fact, BLG's methodology is outlined in the Pragmatic Leadership book series that Sam authored, which includes Get Them on Your Side, The Agenda Mover, and Transforming the Clunky Organization. In fact, Sam has been a regular contributor to Inc. Magazine, where he also writes about pragmatic leadership. And what's interesting is that BLG has applied its leadership framework to elevate leading organizations like Cisco, SunGuard, and Warner Music Group, among others. Uh, in fact, BLG also created the Leading Cornell program for high potentials at Cornell faculty and administration. And that program was recently renamed in Sam's honor, the Samuel B. Backrack Leading Cornell program. So the last thing I'll add is Sam recently laced up his teaching shoes because he's filling in for Tov Hammer who, who suffered an, an injury recently and he's actually leading her undergraduate class on leadership. So he's, he's back in the teaching game as we speak. So without further ado, live from Tel Aviv, my teacher, mentor and friend, Sam Bakrak, who can now share his screen. Thank you. I really wanna first talk about the ILA Alumni Association. Uh, as someone who's been in ILA forever. Some of you out there have been absolutely great assets and, and absolutely great colleagues and friends. And, and I wanna thank you. The ILA alumni community has really been, for the last 20 years, part of my learning network. Uh, you know, people like uh, Paul, Doug, all you guys. I mean, there's been tremendous help for me and I, I really appreciate it. So a lot of these practical ideas I've shared with you all. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, Dean and, and Esther before, and uh, now Jordan. Jordan, as you all know, is, 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 uh, is anything but, uh, in, if not enthusiastic. And uh, a few months ago, uh, he kept on saying, it's all like the kid in Brooklyn. He said, come on, you want to play one more game? Come on, one more game, and you really don't want to play. Well, Jordan got me to do a few more games and work. It's actually been an re-energizing and a uh, wonderful uh, opportunity again. So given all that, it's been a hard time for a lot of people, as some of my friends in Ithaca. So he said to me, you give a talk. Now, what do I know about COVID-19? I mean, I, like most of you, I've been locked up for the last five weeks in, uh, 
in, in my house. And so if someone gives me a chance to talk to somebody, I figured I'd take it. But what I really want to talk about today is the whole notion of leadership in this type of context. And the issue is, what are we going to do to lead our organizations? And if you think I sort of recreated the wheel in the last three, four weeks or five weeks or whatever, because of COVID-19, I haven't. So I asked myself, how do I go back to some of the basic ideas and begin to ask ourselves, what is it about leadership that, that still has some relevance, at least from the perspective of the work that, that I sort of have written about in the last few years? And as I think about it, we all have sort of, for this point, dealt in a sort of my, myopic universe. For the most part, in most of the organizations we've lived in, for no matter what we want to say, we, we have this whole notion that we're big. Most of us have dealt in relatively myopic situations, relatively defined problems, even with all our notions of looseness and networks. The truth of the matter is uncertainty had some sense of control uncertainty. You know, even if you work in a large organization, you sort of work in your own little segment, you tied, but embedded in it is some sort of a notion of a deeply rational universe. Things are expected, things are structured, the organization is structured, even if it's a highly network organization, multi businesses. So even if you're sitting in Bangalore and someone's sitting in San Jose, there's still this notion of order. In the last few weeks, what we've encountered is sort of maybe the end, or at least the challenge. I hope not the end. I live on 17th Street in Manhattan, and if this is the end, I tend to go back there anyway as soon as possible. The point is, it is not the end of anything, but suddenly we're thinking in a less myopic way, because suddenly I talk about organizations being clunky. Suddenly everything has become clunky. Think of this. You know, for all the panache of the Zoom, I've been using Zoom for years, basically, because it's a way of teaching from New York and not being in Ithaca. But the point is, this is a clunky experience. Everything we've done lately is clunky. Everything we've done lately is clunky. We, we don't, we, direct control is difficult. And I don't mean in, in a simple way. I mean, think of just working online. Suddenly, is my style right? How often do I call? What do I do? The world, everything is becoming sprawling. Now, that's true for a lot of organizations. Organizations are clunky entities. Look at Cornell, it is a clunky organization. I mean, it's got semi-autonomous units, it's got this, it's got that. It's got the organizations you're working with for. Most of them, even think of law firms. You know, we think of law firms as highly myopic. I don't know, Paul's online, but my God, I don't know, you know, since I, since I assumed this I lost, I figured 95% of your lawyers anyway. So the point is, think of your organizations, you know, client driven, it's, it's all very clunky. Accountability is now becoming problematic. Just think of the word accountability in this universe. What does it mean to hold someone accountable? Hey, suddenly you're talking to someone and their kid runs across the living room floor. I think that's a wonderful experience, but suddenly you get all, all uptight about how you manage them and you go, hey, excuse me, hey, it's their living room, give them space for God's sake, okay? Communication becomes more fluid, right? You're suddenly, so we're suddenly in a clunky universe and what do we want to do? We want to retreat to this myopic little safety of directive universe. And, and so we don't know quite what to do with it. Now, I'm not telling you the whole world is changing. I, you know, as I spent a lot of my time commuting to tel, tel Aviv in New York, so I've given up on the chicken little attitude that the world's changing because I also remind people, I remember that after, you know, 9-11, the world changed. I don't know what's changing, it's not changing, but suddenly we've gotten sensitive to the idea of clunkiness. Now, that's a leadership problem but it's also a structural problem for organizations. And that's the problem you're gonna be facing, in, in, my, in my opinion. And now, I don't even think it's a problem. I, you know, it's also an opportunity. I mean, if you take a look at some of the industries, if, for example, those of you in real estate out there, you know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh my God, New York real estate is collapsing, yeah, but you're also going into cash and you're saying to yourself, okay, buying opportunity in Washington Heights or whatever you're buying it. Right. There is opportunity if you use the opportunity and you deal with the clunkiness, and you deal with the clunkiness. We know that this is a challenge, but what's the, your, your, as a leader, the challenge now is to deal with the opportunity. Now, we make a big deal out of this leadership stuff. What, I argue in most of my writing is, you know, I know we spend as academic all this stuff talking about leadership, 
What you're trying to do is actually move agendas in a clunky, chaotic, uncertain world. I mean, you do that most of the time, but now that reality, the, 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 the sense of that reality has become more immediate. I mean, I'm not even convinced the world's become more chaotic. It's just our awareness of it. It becomes more chaotic. You know, it's, you get to a certain point and you realize, hey, life is finite. Well, we've gotten to the world point that we suddenly, the world is uncertain. So tell me something new. But now it's become accentuated for us. It's centered and has consequences. But in this context, you have to lead. So what, what about leadership? Look, I, I'm sort of uh, at a point in my life that, you know, can we just stop making believe about leadership? We know what leadership is about. You know, you can talk about charisma, you can talk about all this, you can talk about all that. It's very simple. It's about the pragmatic skills to move agendas. Look, many an uncharismatic Iowa graduate has been a massive success. Now, you can look at each other and wonder who I'm talking about, but a lot of you, and me too, you know, I mean, charisma. I mean, I, I'm sort of fed up with this charisma notion. You know, charisma, you ever ask a bunch of people what charisma is and who's charismatic leaders? You ever notice they'll give you a disproportionate number of, um, of maybe Caucasian males because it's a cultural and gender bias notion. Charisma doesn't get us through anything. It's the ability to execute, not because of who we are, but in spite of who we are. And that's what it's going to take right now, the ability to move those agendas. It's about getting them on your side and keeping them there. What you have to do now is know how to pull people into your corner and keep them there. And that's going to be tough now. That's going to be tough. I predict now that unless we begin to retrain and refocus leaders, this is going to be a hard time because some old nuances of leadership is just not going to get us through this clunky period with this offline, et cetera. It's just not going to work. So what are the challenges? To move your agendas, I think the two things I'd like to enforce today. One, you have to, you know, people talk about leadership style. Look, some of you folks out there have led corporations, and I'm not about to profess to you how to lead. You've got more experience. So, but you know what I mean. You have to be able to mindfully juggle your leadership style. There's a dramaturgy to what we all do, whether we stand in front of the classroom pulling in students or whether you're standing in front of a board, whether you're standing you know, for a group of investors, you've got to juggle your leadership style. Let's talk about that. And then, in particular, I want to emphasize what I mean by partner in this context. You have to partner for discovery and delivery. And let me just do those in a, in a, in a few minutes. All right. First of all, my attitude in, in everything I do is leadership is about pragmatic skills. It, it's, it's a pragmatic notion. You know, this whole idea of the charismatic leader with the sense of calling that drives through the ideology and calls everyone. You know what? That's only true up to a point. If you think, well, how many times did you remember an ideological leader who wasn't pragmatic in their execution? Think of the great leaders. Think, for example, of Martin Luther King. I mean, think of an ideologically committed individual for vision. At the same time, think of who was a better pragmatic leader that understood the skills of getting people and moving things along. So right now, for all our ideology, for everything we have, what we need to do is be, is, is be pragmatic in our, and master pragmatic skills. First of, all, first of all, the whole notion of juggling your tight and loose type of thing. What does it really mean? Some of you have a very, very start the numbers, do this, accountability, it's like traditional HR, job descriptions, here's the goals, here's what we want. You're running around trying to figure out, okay, how can I hold everybody accountable? How can I actually make sure everyone does all this? Hey, folks, uh, you can't even hold people accountable now in the assembly line, okay? How, so it's not simply accountability, it's also at the same time of how can you facilitate and how, now, I'm not talking about facilitation in terms of letting everything go out there be loose, but how do you communicate better? So the whole, how do you engage people? Engagement versus direction. Directing is going to become less important, engagement more important. And engagement is a way of pulling people in, making sure they're self-motivated and get the things you want done to according to your goals because they're self-involved. So not everyone is gonna be able to balance it. So the challenge in leadership training coming down the pike on all levels of the organization is to teach people to go back and forth between two worlds. Now, for those of you that didn't 
anyone who's unfortunate enough to have been in any class I taught in, in 1896, uh, before Morris Neufeld actually showed up. I mean, this whole idea of thinking about social, it's all a dichotomy, it's all this social science dichotomy. Too much control, too loose control. Mindfulness is a powerful notion these days, but what are we mindful about? We have to be mindful of how we're using these two styles. I, I don't want to elaborate on this, but you've got to begin to get people to be agile about the styles that they're doing. In fact, in the face of uncertainty, in which way do you want to move your team? How do you want to move your organizations? When can you be directed? When can you be facilitated? That becomes problematic. Now, you've got the pressure to coordinate and then you've got the pressure to adapt. Now, I think what's going on to a certain degree is too many people are getting online and trying to control this uncertainty by pulling back to their own method because they're scared because they're so worried that the boss is gonna not hold them accountable, hold them accountable. So everybody's pulling in. Everybody thinks things are loosening. I see things in, I've been in two organizations here that everything is getting more massively controlled because there's a panic attack for control, okay? The question is, how do you balance the loosening and control? How do you begin to do that? And that becomes a key leadership question and challenge. And that's true, by the way, and I, I don't wanna elaborate this, on all the things. So example, I'll give you a key strategy, okay? I, are you going to be driven only to products or are you going to be driven to solutions? Um, structure. What are you going to do? How hierarchical, how flat? And again, this is a very quick talk. I don't want to get into the organizational design issue. Goals. Are you going to define the goals so specifically or are you can keep them problem oriented, understood? Work processes. What are you going to do? Are you task oriented or, or problem solving oriented? Yeah. If you do tasks, how do you call people accountable? What does it mean? The problem solving, what does it mean? The point is, how do you direct your organizations, what structures, goals, work processes you can use is going to be affected by this balance between directive and facilitator, between time loose. And, and that's a frame, but I think you've got to get people to think about this. But given all of that, what about the agenda moving skills? So assume that you have a style. What is it that you actually want to lead about? What do you really want to be during this period? What do you want to lead about? Look, this mystery about what leadership is about, and I guess you can't say that as an undergraduate class, because then when are you talk about the rest of the lectures, right? But it's about discovery and delivery. You want leaders to discover new ideas, all that I want to know what's going out there, and then you want them to deliver on them in the organization. So you want to understand the environment, sort of pick up what's going on, you want them to be sensitive to the environment, pick up the competitors, relate to customers, pick up the cues, understand the nuances, take a look at market trends, take a look at the matrix, the wonderful stuff we can do in that area, but understand the environment from customer to change in technology. Now, for God's sake, that's exactly what you want leaders to be doing in your organizations right now. And then you want them with all this work and ideation to take those ideas and make sure those ideas through ideation translate in the organizations. All that is going to become now much more compressed because it's going to depend on your style. And once you've done this, you want to be able to mobilize support. You want to train people to get support, move, get support, get them in your corner, mobilize support so you can actually take ideas and drive them for the organizations, overcome resistance, and maintain and sustain momentum so you can actually go the distance. So to me, after all these years of Cornell, what's leadership about? It's about moving agendas to discover new things and to understand what the competition is like, what the environment is like, and to make sure that internally you're politically smart and managerially clever enough to deliver those ideas. And they involve real micro skills. They involve real micro skills. But in this time, what do we learn? The primary lesson is partnership is that you can't do it alone. So leaders now, if ever before, need to think about part, leading through partnership. Now, let me explain why I've gotten so obsessed by this. Think of what leading really means. Suddenly, you really have to work together. It doesn't mean that you're suddenly sitting around, it's not having a flashback to 1974 and we're sitting around in a sort of a, a session of getting together. No, no, it means that you have to be mindful of the people you're really, really working on in your organization. And you gotta give a sense that you're partnering with them. It doesn't mean that suddenly everything becomes egalitarian, but partnership becomes important. And you partner essentially for two, for two things, discovery and delivery. 
All right, so how do you discover, discover, how do you partner with people for exploration? How do you spot partner with people for ideation to move things up? And then how do you partner with people for mobile to deliver? You know, one of the things I've learned the last number of years is that organizations have more good ideas than they know what to do with. The question is, so you can explore and come up with ideas, but then can you deliver internally? Can you deliver internally? Have you trained your people with the micro skills that they need to deliver and turn it to mobile support and to go the distance? So I want to go over each of these areas and keep the partnership in mind. And, and what I'm simply saying, the mindset of partnership has to shift. Look, I, 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 this is not sort of going back to human relations schools in 1928. Remember all those? I go back to Bill White and all that. I'm not going back there. I'm talking strategically, the way I dialogue with people and link with people, how do I partner with them? You know, you want the best examples, think of research teams. If someone's in charge, but how do you pull people in? So you want to win them over, you don't want to just simply take them over. Here's a few little tips. Uh, I'd send you these, um, you, 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 don't have, you don't want to start giving it to things that you know you, 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 know you don't know everything. I, I found that out after, 20 years of teaching, you, you know, you want to give them a sense you have a master of the business. You're committed to the relationship. You project agility. You want to feel that you give people a stage and that you don't need the front stage. We well, can go this list, but there are a lot of things that you can do nuanced to give you a sense of partnership. But I want to take a look at specific areas you can partner in. Partnering for exploration. All right, here. What's going to become important is what's always been important to you in, in business in the world. Reading signals, reading weak and strong signals. Now I've written a lot about it and I'm not going to be able to chance it, but think about it. What are the signals? We're all sitting around saying, uh, what, what did he say? Wait, oil went down to what? What is that? Look, we always read signals unless you're, you know, I mean, we do it in investment, in investment strategy. I mean, this idea that investment, no offense, investment strategy is, is a science, but you kindly gathering information, picking up nuances, picking up cues, taking a look at what the customer is saying, picking up in terms of what the competition, suddenly that's become more difficult. Suddenly becomes more difficult. Suddenly becomes more difficult. You know, the idea that you don't have face-to-face, -face, you don't have contact, what's really going on, it suddenly become more difficult. Picking up the signals is becoming, you think just data picks it up, and you know that's not the case, unobtrusive. So now you're really going to have to partner with people even more deeply to pick up signals. That means establishing trust. So we can talk about weak and strong signals, competition, numbers, et cetera, but how do you interpret it? And that becomes, it's going to become much more important than ever before. Strong signals are easy. Data. You know, and weak signals, nuances in the story. For those of you, if you remember, you're, 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 the I law thing, remember all those papers you read, you know, like the, the number crunching, the ASQ and the Academy of Manual, all those numbers, those numbers are only numbers. The predictions are only predictions. Without a story embedded on them, nothing happens. The numbers don't tell a complete story. Experience also tells a story. We signal. So when I wrote the papers, so valid and true and statistical. If I didn't use some common sense in discussions with colleagues and friends and students, I couldn't interpret the data. So that implies a type of partnership and teaching people to do that. And that means to understand nuances, you're going to start having to dialogue for exploration. Now, we've worked on dialogue for explorations. That means you're going to have to start listening with curiosity. You're going to have to really begin, you know, all this stuff that we used to talk about, listening skills, Hearing skills, reflecting, questioning, all that feedback, not fact in your ways. You know, feedback for a partnership because you want to get something. You know, let me just say something. Partnership is about getting something. And I don't mean getting something in a negative sense. I partner with Jordan because he's my friend. I trust him. But, you know, Jordan and I also have an instrumental relationship. I'm getting something. He's getting something. We're trying to share information. So it's, 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 it's instrumental and normative. And it depends on the dialogue. It's going to depend on dialogue. And that's going to become more important. What about the next thing? Partnering for ideation. Partnering for taking ideas and actually making them to something. That's going to also be a problem. 
the days in which, you know, everything comes to the IDO's model, Kelly's model, they'll be just doing it. And that, you know, that's one thing when you're doing design for Apple. But now, how are you actually going to encourage the sense of collective? Think of what the sense of collective is going to mean from here on. So people can trust each other and share information. I mean, in this new world, jobs shortages, competition, think of this new world, which hopefully is, is not that new. And, because I just don't have the energy for one more new world. But the point is, think of that world. You're going to have to collectively share information. You're going to have to frame challenges. You're going to have to facilitate ideation. How are you going to do this? How are you going to balance, for example, sometimes some short and long-term goals? How are you actually going to lead? We all know about divergence, convergent thinking. How are you going to do that? But you suddenly have to begin to ask yourself seriously, what is all this really going to mean? What is all this going to mean? For example, here's one thing. The best ideas in organizations never came simply from individuals. If you go from major companies, recently I worked with a collaborative technology unit of a major company. If you know collaborative technology, you know what company it was, and there were a whole bunch of engineers. I mean, we're talking MIT on steroids. I was the dumbest person, I mean, in, in the room by far. You know what they didn't know? They, 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 never, they never created a loan. It was all in these little hot groups that they talked to each other. How do we sustain these hot groups? How do we make sure that we, as managers and leaders, gain something from those hot groups and not threatened by them? So how do we give people the safety that they need to create in this new environment? That's partnership for ideation. And my favorite, partnering for mobilization. As Dylan talks about this is CAD time. I think this is a time when organizations are going to be more open for change and people are going to be more open to change than ever before. And I know that sounds ridiculous when I say that, but this change has been fostered on people. If you don't believe it, my uncle, who's 94 years old and lives in Tel Aviv all his life, is actually Zooming with me. I mean, he's Zooming with me. Change is in the air and it is in organizations. Think of, you know, I do a lot of higher ed. What's going on? Suddenly I've been in touch with a, a good friend of mine who works for Cisco and, uh, and uh, is been living in Milan and we talk all the time and, and suddenly we're beginning to talk about what does this really mean about the exchanges we've had all the time? Suddenly this Technology is, is no longer an imposition, it's a liberating tool for some people. So change is in the air. Structural change is coming. People are open to change. The question is, what do you do with it? Partnership is about knowing where people are coming from, anticipating their arguments of resistance, and overcoming their hesitations. For example, if you want to create partnerships, who are you going to need on your corner? Who are the top dogs? Who are the gurus? The people that sort of, you know, you, know, you think about a lot. You know, think about a lot. I've had the good fortune to be a long, around a long time. Now, sometimes, you know, if I look at the top dogs, it's always like David Lipsky, who's going through, and we know a difficult time and now, we wish him the best. David Lipsky, um, Harry Katz. But every so often, I'd be called in, and I'm not sure I was called in, not as a gatekeeper. I'm just not the gatekeeper part. Maybe as a player, and, and, and as I got older, more white hair as a group. Who are the people you need in your organization to move stuff and partnering with them? More importantly, however, know the agendas of people. Think of the people you're going to have to move now. Some of them are set in their ways. They're traditionalists. They're going to be so set in their ways. Who are they? And, how are you, what, and what are you going to do with them? On the other hand, you're going to have a whole bunch of revolutionaries that will come down. Wow, let's take Cornell and just give it over to eCornell and let's get rid of the faculty. Let's get and move on and get a few tapes and just what the hell and, and keep the kids at home. And then you have the developers who are going to move when they have to. And then you're going to have things like the adjusters. So we'll say, look, let's wait till October. We'll see how things are moving and then we'll adjust. You're going to have to know the styles in order to be able to partner with these people, in order to be able to partner with these people. Now, finally, they're going to resist everything you're saying because you're actually, there's going to be threatened. They're going to be threatened. And the key to partnership in trying to move agendas is to anticipate people's fear. Well, 
I only believe the very minimum, when people say you don't do your homework, this is going to be an age in which you're going to have to do your homework in order to lead. That means you're going to have to anticipate people's arguments. They're scared out there. They're terrified. And they're going to tell you they've tried it before. Your idea is too risky. You're doing it all wrong. You don't know the issues well enough. Your idea is only going to make things worse. Your proposal won't make a ch change the thing. They're going to tell you all of this. They're going to tell you all of this. And you're going to have to anticipate their arguments. You're going to have to sit down and actually anticipate it. And then you're going to have to persuade them. And you know what? So in the next couple of years, look at the numbers is not going to be enough. And in, in best practice, everyone is doing it. it may not work. You know, right now, someone asked me the other, the other day, how are we going to get people to wear masks in the retail business? Well, one argument is to say to people, they're making us do it. That won't be enough. And then there's the moral argument. People expect it of us. How you articulate your argument, your persuasion argument, and how you think about it politically is going to become more important than it ever has been. You're going to have to do your homework, not, and I mean by articulating what you're going to do. That's what leaders are going to have to, have to think about language, and we're going to have to train people to think like this. And then there's a following. And this more than anything else, for all our sakes, for everyone that's working with you, think, stop thinking only about your ideas. Think about their fears, their fear of failure. Your responsibility in this time is illustrate success. You're going to have a new idea. You're going to go online. What are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to buy some more real estate. You, 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 you're actually going to in, in, in invest in, in a middle-sized company in Japan. You go, there you have a discomfort with your risk. Put it in their words. Minimize the risk. They have a fear of new perspective. The world is terrified right now of this new perspective. Think of how to put that perspective in their reality. Turf paranoia. Do you know how many people are running around here thinking, even though I have my job, everyone is cringing on my turf because we're doing things? So be concrete, accentuate the payoff, ambiguity, and, and don't fear of losing face. So finally, partnering for momentum. You've got them, you've got the ideas, you move the ideas, you've got the ideas, and you're moving them, partnering for momentum. Work with your people, not for the big victories, but the little victories as we move into this time. Don't try to win the world, try to win the next step. You want to create trust and you want to be able to give the next step. You know, don't, don't go out there prom promising a 30% return. Promise that you won't be negative, okay? Don't go out there, give them small victories. Help people validate in this time their ideas and validate your new ideas to, to enhance that sense of forward movement. Don't make adjustments. And you know, making adjustments is going to be tough because every time you make a change, someone's going to think, oh, you screwed it up or you're having a panic attack. No, no, make the adjustments together. And during this period, reinforce the payoff. Tell people that in the long term, we're going to get through this, we'll restructure, and here's the payoff. You know, in many ways, I'm asking many of you to return to the vitality that you had of startups. And then you had to go, go back to that. And there is a sense of that right now. There's a sense of terror, but there's also this, this sense of it. So that's my whole notion. And like any I law, so that really is the notion of what I'm talking about. You want partner for exploration. You want to be agile about your ideas, flexible. You want to, part, you want to know about your style. Direct and facilitate You want this partner for delivery, partner for exploration, partner for ideation, partner for mobilization, sustain momentum. What's going to happen in the next few years and what's happening right now is everyone is going to need everyone. This does not mean that I am returning to Madison, Wisconsin in 1971, lighting a candle, moving to New York. No, no, I'm pragmatic. I want people to get their work done. So I want to make sure they're on my side. And with that note, I, uh, I'll, uh, plug, I'll leave you with that's it. And that's it. I'm, I'm off. Jordan, thank you very much. I hope I didn't over talk this. And um, are there any questions, et cetera? Excellent. So first of all, wonderful presentation. Um, you still have it. Uh, there, there are some comments about that the color of your hair may be different, but the voice is exactly the same. And uh, I love Garrett's comment. Um, uh, he is a Sam fanboy for life, and I have to tell you that Meryl Fink uh, asked if I'd pass along her great thanks. She said it, 
It has brought a huge smile to her face to be brought back to that wonderful time in Ives Hall uh, to hear a, such a positive voice of reason during these unsettled times. I think the question is, uh, is, is Merrill thinking about the old Ives Hall with the linoleum tile and the cubbies or the brand new beautiful <laughs> Uh, I saw. I think she's thinking about the concert huts when I taught, when I first showed up there with the stagecoach. Yeah, it, it it very well could be. So so the good news is that we've got quite a few questions, and Sam, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read them off to you one at a time, and let let's dig into it first. So Valerie Benjamin, shout out to her. She was the first okay. courageous person to ask a question, and I'm going to read her question. Yeah. So and it's a two parter. One is you know Sam, what are the implications for leaders? who they're leading in a more virtual world, uh, but you know, how do they lead when this is sort of settling into the new normal? And how do you help leaders kind of make that shift from sort of that results-based performance management versus activity when you can't see your employees? I, I, th I, think, I think, you know, I did this crazy thing on this with NPR the other day. I, I, th I think that that's a paramount question, but I really don't think it's that difficult. I think some people are just not gonna be able to, to make the change. And I think we're gonna to have to actually consider how we're actually training people. So for example, think about what we're gonna to have to reestablish. Uh, we are still gonna to have to have people accountable, but are we gonna hold people accountable for the eight hours that they're online? Excuse me, I mean, the, I mean think of the, the idiocy of it. Are we gonna hold people accountable because we're there talking to them and their kid is running across the living room floor? You know, so, so we can be hold accountable for. We're gonna to have to hold people accountable for outcomes. And we're gonna to have to have the responsibility of outcomes. And that outcomes, outcomes may be market returns. That outcomes may be number of customers served, but we're gonna to have to hold people more accountable for outcomes. And then we're gonna to have to think about how we hold people accountable for process, okay? Now, what does it mean process online? How do you communicate with customers? How do you come up with ideas? And we can begin to do that. But our responsibility is to begin to shift the game and not to might, you know, we have this whole notion that the world has shifted, you know, before. And, you know, I, I love this. For years we're talking about human relations and all this. Come on, folks, face it. Taylorism is alive and well, and so does dominate still corporate, the corporate world. What we're going to have to figure out is I, the, 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 the Ronald Reagan fans out there, you're going to cut the line, but the rest of you don't have a fit. I mean, remember trust and verify? I mean, we also have to deal with that balance of trusting people, giving them space, and that can be done in, in, in very simple ways. Let me give you an Air Force example. I studied them um, for a while, I looked at, 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 at pilots, uh, and specifically F-16s that are flown by themselves. Now, if you can be up there in the air and you can mess up there completely what you're doing, no one really knows completely what you did at one time, okay? No one knows what you did uh, in, in the detail or the micro detail. Now it's a little change, but in who are you accountable for? You are accountable back on the ground to the group and ask me who's more accountable than Air Force pilots. So my answer is we're gonna to have to think about that creatively and begin to treat people in sort of a collective mannerism, but still hold them accountable through trust and mechanisms like that. There's a lot of stuff on this. I think we have to think about how to train people to supervise the whole notion of supervision, the way we've done it for a long time, with just this kumbaya feedback sessions and all that. It's, 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 I, I don't see it continuing. Yeah. I'm not uh, that's a great response, Sam. Here's a question from uh, Ali Imrani, and, and hopefully I'm pronouncing these names uh, accurately. Um, and, and, and Ali referenced, these days we hear a lot about purpose-driven leadership. So how, do you, how does purpose-driven leadership relate to pragmatic skills for leaders that you share today, Sam? Um, I think that, uh, I don't know about purpose leading, but I think passion-driven leadership, okay? I think what we can do as leaders, I mean, first of all, we can share with people the passion of what we've done and our own internal commitment. When I talk about leadership in terms of that sense, my goal is to get people committed to some vision or idea that I've got, but it's not to work. It's as a purpose to what I'm doing. And it's my goal to in, in, get them in that. But at the same time, I to be a partner in the pragmatic skills that will, that will translate that 
to reality. For all the passion, you know, I always think about sometimes at Cornell, you know, you stood up there and you taught all this and you did all this and you did And finally, you know, you sat there and you, you and I was hollow with those crazy steel desks. That's why after 22 years, I've moved here. I'm, there's a desk. It comes down to also the work that you did. It's the work that you did. For all the passion, all the purpose in the world, we must enter an age now with pragmatic sharing, of pragmatic partnership, the simple skills. For example, I'll give you a case. Uh, feedback. Feedback. I'll give you all experience. I remember, I don't know what was the purpose of at, at Cornell. I remember years ago, it must have been 15 years coming out of a study, two Cornell studies, 15 years after I was teaching, most of you that had the trauma of having me in my first 10 years when I thought I was so bright and so intelligent, so gifted because I had a PhD. I remember one day someone walked, student walked to my class and after class I had this big steel desk there and David Lipsky was downstairs still chomping on his cigar and Morris Neufeld was jogging around. I don't know what's going on, but, but, but I realized at that moment that student asked me a question and I sat back and that the student actually was a little awe in a negative sense and nervous. At that moment, I realized I couldn't motivate the student and I walked around the desk and I still could be a total ass about some issues, but that's the difference. I walked around the desk and I realized, and I introduced myself and I began a dialogue. Michael lesson number 101. You know, you learn through practice. You need to connect with people. You need to teach people these micro little skills. You need to understand their fears. For example, right now, if I want to move an agenda at Cornell, I'm going to have these, I've been, I was involved early in development of eCornell courses, right? You know what it took to get a buy-in? People thought I was out of my mind to do eCornell. So you had to convince people, you had moving programs to New York. Who do you move? So you know what? Purpose, passion, charisma, great. I totally believe in it. We responsible. But in the, in push comes to shove, pragmatic leaders, you know, give me people that lead because of their skill. Name me, you know, and that, that's the last time Gates accused of is being, I heard him one talk, I, I don't think anyone's accused him of being charismatic. It may have a purpose, but it's a roll up the sleeve leadership. Excellent. So Sam, uh, we've got about uh, six or seven other questions and please keep them coming because you know we've got to do like the lightning round <laughs> at the very end. So this one's coming from Garrett Lowe. Um, and Garrett wanted to hear your thoughts on how do you recreate informality in a virtual office oh, culture? I, I, I love it, okay? I love it, yeah, it's great. I, I actually talk about how do you create intimacy, okay? And, and this is gonna be great. You know, now, I gotta tell you, it doesn't mean we're all gonna run down to the actor's studio. I have no idea, but, but that's a great question. All right, so guys, today, for the next 15 minutes, I will speak about the three points of leadership. Point one, get the point, it's how we present each other. What I just did now was today we're gonna to break the few. Our challenge of engagement has never been greater. Informality now becomes a dramaturgical tool. We can't simply, we have to, you know, little things like body language. Think for a moment. Now, okay, I, I keep on talking with my hands, but we all know where that comes from culturally, et cetera, okay? So, Body language become important. Eye contact will become important. I, you know, and I learned this. I, I, I have, a, I have, a, uh, I have a, uh, a great coach who works with me on, on, on these issues. She's actually sitting right here. My wife always told me the body language and the coaching work we do. How do you coach people? How do you listen? How do you actually kibitz with people? Kibitz, loosely translated, joking. And those who went to Ila and didn't know what kibitz was, eh, wrong show. The point is, how do you joke with people? How do you keep it intimate? And that's a skill we can teach people. How do you let them loosen their head? That's important. That's a very, very little things, for example. How do you meet with people? How do you interact? We can teach people those skills by getting them comfortable in their own skin, but not everyone, you know? Do you remember the days when we first had computers in Ives Hall? Do you remember how many people quit because they didn't know what to do with them? A lot of people are gonna to have to move on because we, they're just not gonna be able to lead the way they used to. So that's a great question. I've been worrying about that, thinking about that. Uh, email me, I'll send you some stuff. Excellent. So Sam, we've got, about, we've got 10 questions in 10 minutes. So uh, we're not All in right. the speed round, but we're in the concise round. So okay. we have an anonymous attendee who it's somewhat of, is a confession. She says, I'm a, uh, or he says, I'm a lawyer, I'm a librarian, not a lawyer. 
one of those very rare ILRs who is not a JD. I'm one that actually listens to Gordon Law. That's good. <laughs> exactly. And so, so this librarian had said, you know, partnering for discovery and delivery is exactly what we do as we share information as librarians. How can those of us working in education or libraries succeed and lead going forward? Let me just tell you, I'm sitting here working on some books right now, okay? My, and, and some are not traditional ILR books, and so no one, nothing has become more important than the sharing of knowledge. I remember Sue Bisesky, if you remember Stuart, all, and, and I remember ILR, the, the idea, the role of libraries, and, and I'm really intrigued by this, as the people that help us control Mission. I think that it's absolutely amazing what we don't know about what's happening in the digital world about the sharing of information. Right now, for example, I need to use some archives, something I'm looking at. Some is not available, so I've actually been working with, with a group of uh, people in uh, this one library in Jerusalem, etc. I'm looking at archives. I think the role of library has to be redefined, and that is you people are actually the controllers of information. And that has to do with what I talked about. You're the people that are gonna to have to be brought in to read those signals and give the information to people so they can read the signals. I think that corporations have to reach out to academic and other libraries in order to reach out. It's all about this unified network. I mean, the idea, for example, that you still need special access to Cornell libraries I think it's still a clunky link between decisions organizations make and the information that's out there. We're still punting. So I think that redefining the role of libraries in relation to the corporate world is going to be very important. Excellent. So uh, keeping it nice and tight, here's another question from Joyce Reynolds Sinclair. Um, your recommendations for ways to partner to shrink for success in this time of COVID, meaning you know, urgency to reduce size to resources. Uh, uh, and and the, the question is, uh, if there's urgency to reduce size of resources in a large step rather than a thousand cuts. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about those kind of small wins versus the larger ones. Just how do you balance the two is I think what the question is. Uh, let's talk, I don't know if I quite understand the question, but let, let me talk about what we've done in the last few weeks in corporations. Let me give you an instance, furloughs. Okay, a lot of companies are furloughing stuff, uh, um, finance, et cetera, et cetera. So if you furlough, you get, you get a home. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've gotten concerned about is, you know, and we're not sure who we're going to bring back and who we're not going to bring back. And that's the secret, okay? Some of us know that the fact what we just done is cut people that we're going to cut anyway. And we sort of let them go and furlough and succeed. That's one thing. But now we have a different problem. Who are we going to bring back and who are we not going to bring back, okay? My notion right now is that's going to be a big problem. I worry that we cut everything and that we won't be able to restart in some of these companies. So an industry I know well, let's talk about the real estate industry. The first thing that you're going to let go right now are your acquisition people. Why? Because you're not buying right now and you're holding that side. So you keep a few to look at the properties. What happens? Does that mean you've let them go? I think we're in a very difficult thing. So I'm worried right now that certain companies are going to make the big cuts that they thought they're going to make because they anticipate some recession center and won't be able to come on board. My whole notion is how do you make the cuts right now, but still leave the back door open and a number of ways of doing that. And I can talk about that. I'll be happy to talk about it again, email me. But the whole idea is watch what's going on around this furlough stuff and be careful that you don't owe this crazy optimist, but it's very Excellent. interesting. It's also how you have the dialogue around that. So Sam, I'm gonna move into speed round because you know we have to get to a question from my buddy Franz Kaya, which is gonna be coming in a few. So get ready for that one. Wow. How are you, Franz? Yeah. But, but uh, we're gonna give you a couple of really, so I want really tight answers, like 15, 20 seconds, because we got five okay. minutes here. So Veronica Koziel, or Kozel, she goes, I have a question for young alumni. What do you think we as young professionals should do as aspiring leaders, but especially in the face of our training being put on hold in the face of the pandemic and the face of distrust across our team? So what should young alumni do really quick? Uh, young alumni should actually pay attention to their father. You hear that, Ben? My son graduated Cornell two years ago in ILR, so I figured my advice is to Ben, listen to me, you'll be fine. No, if he's listening. But the point is, I think that young, the Alumni Association itself 
provides an opportunity. The idea of using the alumni network, and I talk about this something. Look, it's a wonderful thing we've got here. You reach out to some of your alum, reach out to people you can learn from. This is an actual learning opportunity. I look. I don't believe that the people on the on 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 the, on the life rafts on the on the on the uh, on the uh, on the Titanic are learning anything. When I take a look at the, some of the work that Jordan has been doing with dialoguing, what's going on? I take a look at Jordan as we created his organizations, etc. When I think of of the whole notion, their young alumni have an opportunity now more than ever before, and they. Not opportunity because you were looking for it, but to reach out to it. And uh, I think using this alumni network is, is really out there. But on the other hand, what I can't stand is the HR people that simply let people go and say, you know, this is a good opportunity. Go online and learn a few more courses and you'll learn something. Network, network, mentor, mentor, network, mentor, Joe Bonds. Use your informal networks to learn. And Sam, that, that is, I mean, we, we have a little uh, tagline we use that's, that's more of a, a, a mission is the ILR Alumni Association, from Ives we rise. So we really feel that even though uh, maybe we're not going to do as many happy hours, although we do have a virtual happy hour coming up in May, it's about sharing, it's about mentoring, it's about even, uh, you know, providing internships for ILR students so you can pay it forward to, to those even younger than you, Veronica. Uh, again, really quick, I'm going to throw out a bunch of super speed round here. This is for the bonus points. Uh, Brandon Ashley, so partnership. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so partnership, how does that relate to laying off workers? And I think you almost hit that on the, the furlough comment. I think it lays off on the dialogue. It lays off through dialogue. The idea that, that, that how you establish the dialogue, you know, something, it's hard to, it's hard to partner with somebody in the morning, but the skills of empathy, you know, but you know, really the skills of empathy, not condescending, but understanding where they're coming from and in, in, in really talking about the training. One of the things I always take a look at the fact is when you hire someone, one of the things you ought to be telling them is to focus on their resume. The idea, for example, that you could be in a law firm and maybe not make partner, but that resume is with you and those people will sponsor you and help you go for another job. Be their partner as they move ahead because you had no choice to let them go, but be their partner. Don't worry about that. Excellent. So uh, Amy Chavitz has a question and, uh, and, and hers is more about, hey, how does this apply in terms of pragmatic leadership to the nonprofit sector, given there are quite a few of us that work on that side of the... Uh, the, the I, I think in the nonprofit section, I actually involved some nonprofits here, but the nonprofit section has always had this one challenge because in, in working with volunteers, whether it's Cornell volunteers, whether it's fundraising, et cetera, you really are put with the challenges of moving people over, convincing them, dealing with them, you know, where you're working in development, where you're working with people that are not well paid and are driven by mission. I think the challenge is a pragmatic leadership. Again, think what I think pragmatic leadership is. It's essentially about whether that is customers, people you work with. It's about those skills. And that's true in every organization. And it's very, very true more so in, in the organizations that you're working with. I mean, that becomes absolutely critical. I, I sit on the board of a nonprofit, that becomes very, very essential. I, you know, more so, again, I, Anyone has a discussion, you have to do it on the, I'd love to talk about nonprofits, but just Zoom me, I'll talk to you about it. It's very important now. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, so this is a question for Tanya Hallett, uh, who I believe is uh, out in Detroit at a small auto manufacturing company, financial GM. But uh, Tanya's question is, you know, in the manufacturing sector, we've got the challenge of managing people have to work, you know, from, from work and those who can work virtually. How do you recommend leaders or policymakers, you know, message equity to both groups in relation to flexibility and balance between the two? That, that is absolutely, that's absolutely a great question. And the real question is, what do you do with leaves? What do you do with rotations? What do you do with people that have to be online? What are the perks that you actually give them? What do you do with different types of workday combinations that give them a sense that you're being flexible about their time? So what happens when you give, there are things that you could do there Number one. Number two, you know, we're talking about working offline, but how do you also at the same time, let me just talk about working offline. It's like teaching offline. I've got a lot of equine alpha. The only reason most of you even listening to me is because we've met someplace before. 
you can't do everything online, offline. You're still going to have to get together to establish that informality. I think the equity issue can be dealt with if, number one, people offline are held accountable and you come in, and people, and meaning people offline get some flexibility and you're creative about that and recognition and that it's not seen as a status differentiation. And people online also held accountable and brought into the office every so often. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with them. But the sense that there'll be a feeling of inequality, that's a big thing. Right, so Sam, so two, two last questions before we wrap. Any questions we do not answer, I'd like folks to send an email, jordan at ofc.tv. So, so two, two last questions. This is from Nina Candido. She said, many thanks, Sam. It's a timely and much needed reminder of critical core skills in the midst of uncertainty. Any tips on keeping your teams motivated through layoffs, furloughs, and all these economic pressures? How do you keep their spirits up and motivated? Um, you know, I, we've all had to do that lately, both keep ourselves motivated and keep others motivated. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of getting tired of talking to new gloom, gloom, doom things. I think your responsibility as a leader is to provide hope, but not false hope. To provide opportunity, but not to provide dreams. I think we give people motivation to lose their jobs by being, by being there with them, by helping them, by assisting them. And I think part of it is people pick up on our own motivation. You know, I kind of think about it when, you talk, when, I, when I taught. So I can't remember the number of times you go into teaching and you feel like absolute rubbish. And I'm most like messed up. But the idea, people can read whether you're motivated to help them. I think I know several sort of weird stuff, but it's very concrete how you coach, how you're listening, how you really reach out. What's the nature of, the, you know, we, I keep on training people on dialoguing. And what is the dialogue you have? You know the way you talk to pers a person that has an impact on, on their motivation and their optimism. I think we, again, it's training people to talk differently. Uh, so so uh, last question, and got to ask Fonzo's question, and then we can respond. If the last the question is how, yeah, yeah. How long do you give an organization? So, so, so how, how, how long do you give an organization before you realize they're not able or willing to adjust this environment and realize we should change, you know, change the dynamics? How much patience do you need? You know, I love, I, I love the name of the book, How the Mighty Have Fallen. By the time most people realize that organizations need help, most people, a lot of times it's too late. Okay, you know, I mean, I always have this notion that you really have to understand, like leaders have to understand when their organizations don't meet their potential. You all know of companies, and, and I can name a whole bunch, that actually were doing great on paper, but the leaders picked up the cue that the momentum was dying. Leaders understand that, they get in front of it. And that's why, I mean, it's a, to me, there are a whole bunch of ways. You, you know, you stay with the same customers. You stay with the same routines. You go for short-term wins rather than long-term games. You develop the same product. You do very little innovation. There are a lot bunch of ways of doing that. So that, that's it. So um, anyway, I'm happy to hear from any of you on LinkedIn and any place else. You know, email me. It's not such a big mystery. I, I welcome the reunion. Thank you very much, everybody. Guys, uh, thanks for our first inaugural uh, virtual event for the ILR Alumni Association. The this will be a regular uh, element of us engaging our community and uh, really, uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for joining us.